be seated. All right, let's go to Mark chapter 3 tonight. Mark chapter number 3. Tonight, what if you had the opportunity to choose how much you were paid? Amen. Yeah, I know. <laughs> thought it took a long time for somebody to at least say that. You're like, huh, yeah, that'd be great. Okay, well, let's go a little bit further and say, let's say you had to choose between, you had two options. Option number one, you got paid $1,000 a day for 31 days. Like, wow, that's pretty good, right? Or one cent a day, doubled each day for 31 days. Which would be better? Well, the first option, they garner you about $31,000 in a month. I could handle that. I mean, I, I, I'm sure I could suffer for Jesus with that amount, you know? <laughs> I'm sure I could figure it out. And that would be a great salary, obviously. But it pales in comparison to the, the other option, which would land you over $5 million. You know, this illustrates the explosive power of multiplication. When it comes to spreading the gospel message, the Lord wants every person to hear, obviously. We're really well aware of that. But with so many people in the world, how is that possible? How is that possible? I believe it has something to do with a concept we often refer to or call discipleship. Discipleship. In our text, we see Jesus is going to select 12 men out of the multitudes of disciples following him for the distinct purpose of intimately training them so that they could, in turn, train and disciple others. Mark 3, verse 13, we're going to start here. And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, and he surnamed them uh, Bonerges, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphas, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into a house." Tonight, let's talk about what I call a personal investment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this night, this time in thy word. I pray that it would be a help and an understanding of uh, one of the elements, key elements of what we call the Great Commission, the thing of discipleship. Lord, we just want to look at the passage and just glean some truths from it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, God's greatest desire, of course, is for people to be saved. We talked about that significantly this morning. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, I mentioned, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. God really, really wants people to get saved. It is the heartbeat. It is his heartbeat, and I believe he wants that to be our heartbeat as well. As we know, salvation is simply a time in a person's life when they come to the Lord to find forgiveness and atonement for their sins. Obviously, the Bible teaches us that we have all sinned. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And as a result, we must have our sins forgiven if we hope to avoid the judgment of God against those sins. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we find forgiveness and restoration with the Lord through his plan of salvation, as outlined in the scriptures. A person must come to God, of course, as we know, with a heart of contrition. A heart of contrition, a heart that is genuinely sorrowful and desires to go in a new direction in life, and is willing to turn to God with all their heart, or what we call, what the Bible often refers to as repentance. And by faith, trust Jesus Christ to atone for their sins. Romans 10, 13, I think we're very familiar with, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can I ask us a question here this morning and tonight? I just laid out a very simple salvation plan. When was the last time you personally told somebody about that? 
if you're saved here today, when was the last time you personally said anything like that to somebody else? Pretty basic, pretty simple, isn't it? And guess what? We are responsible to give that message out in some capacity. But when was the last time you personally said something? When was the last time you personally gave it to somebody? Was it this past week? Was it this past month? Has it been at all this year? See, I give out tracks, and that's a great thing. Please don't stop. But we have to get beyond that, too, where we talk to people, and we say, you know, have you ever thought about what happens when you die? Have you ever thought about this? You know, we, we've got to get beyond that. I'm all for inviting to church. Please invite as much as possible. But we have to get beyond our fears sometimes and, and realize, you know what, if people don't get that message, where are they going to go? Where are they going to go tonight? Where are they going to go? Think about that loud. And, you know, let it ring in our hearts a little bit. Where are they going to go? See, God wants us to get that same heart. Because that's his heart. He sees the end result. And obviously, I would hope that maybe when you're sharing the gospel, you go through more than just the three verses. <laughs> but at the same time, too, we have to speak up. We'll speak up about a lot of things. We'll speak up about politics. We'll speak up about, uh, you know, all the wrongs going on in our world. We'll speak up about all the quote-unquote atrocities. But you know why all that stuff's going on? Because people are lost. And I have to remind myself of that. I got fired up about something this afternoon I heard. <laughs> My wife knows exactly what I'm talking about. And it just burns me, some of the garbage I see going on in this world. But you know something? I... The Lord reminds me too, hey, look, buddy, the reason they do what they do is because they're lost as lost can be. And we can curse the dark, but if we're not trying to turn on the light with our words to somebody else, then, then we're, no, we're not helping the cause one bit. Are we? I mean, honestly. This is God's heartbeat. He wants folks to be saved. And of course, after they get saved, the Lord desires that people grow in the likeness of Christ. You know, God doesn't just want to save them and send them on their way. All right, have a good life after that. No, he's got some ideas. He's got some plans. And one of the biggest things he wants is to change, save people, just like you and I, into being a model, for, just like Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 29, very familiar verse. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that we, he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Many brethren. Of course, God brings that about, that change about starting on the inside and then it bubbles its way on the outside. Now, to bring that process along, God has given the New Testament church. The New Testament church. Now, the church isn't wherever you're at. Well, I'm a Christian. I'm on the golf course. I'm in church. Baloney. That's, that's not true at all. <laughs> This idea, I can be on the lake and be in church. Baloney. That's baloney. Yeah, a lot of people, who are, they're in church, but they're, they're running a marathon. They're, on, they're in church, but they're, they're on the lake. They're in church, but they're at Disney World. You know what I mean? That's not church, folks. It's not church at all. Church is an assembly. It's a local assembly. It's an ecclesia. It's the place where God plants people so that they can grow and flourish and use their gifts and talents for the glory of God. That's, where, that's what it is. And you know what? God's given New Testament churches for that purpose. If you go to Ephesians chapter number 4, Ephesians chapter number 4, It says here in verse number 11, he says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. That's the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, 
that we henceforth be no more children and tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is in the head, which is the head, even Christ. This is a really rich portion of scripture, but I think you get the gist of it. God has given the New Testament church to perfect the saints so they can go out and minister. That's what it, that's what it kind of boils down to. And one of the things a church is to provide is the opportunity for newly saved people to be mentored, or we might use the word discipled, in the ways of the Lord. When Jesus departed this earth, he gave a command. We call it the Great Commission. And there's verses in every gospel and the the book of Acts that communicate this summed up in some capacity. I think the most the, the fullest example of it is in the end of Matthew. And, and, there's, and this, I just put it up the last verse because it's what I'm talking about here tonight. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Part of the Great Commission is evangelism, and that's, a, that's an important aspect. Then there's baptism, which, which unites somebody with a local New Testament church. But then, but then there's the teaching part. This is the discipleship aspect. This is just as critical. You can save them and leave them, but God wants us to save them and teach them. That's what he wants. Discipleship is the process of a mature Christian committing himself or herself, as it were, to an extended period of time to one or maybe a few individuals for the purpose of aiding, guiding, equipping their spiritual growth so that they can go out and do the same. That's what discipleship is in, in a nutshell. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2 is a very well-given verse on this subject. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. And if, you, if we had time, we could go through the book of Acts, and you can see a line of discipleship of different people. As an example, you could take Barnabas, who discipled Paul. Paul discipled Timothy. And then, of course, Timothy had become, became a pastor. There's, and there are some others, too, that you could talk about. But you see this process of discipleship and how critical it is. I believe it's scripturally accurate that Christians should be producing more Christians if you follow what I'm talking about here tonight. We should be producing more Christians. In other words, investing our lives in others so that they can be used of God to do the same. And what we want to do that. If we are saved, we know that God desires to produce fruit out of our lives, right? John 15, 8, Wherein is my, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. You know, God wants to bear good fruit out of your life and mine. Part of that fruit, our lives being one to Christ and mentored to a place of maturity and ability to go and reach others. It's through this process the gospel has the potential of reaching the whole world in just one generation, which occurred in the first century. Colossians 1.23, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Right there. Where have I, Paul, and made a minister? Wow. That's incredible, isn't it? How was that possible? Each one reached one and then taught one. And it just exploded with multiplication. Now, that doesn't mean everyone got saved. We know that didn't happen. But at least everyone had an opportunity. Because there were people who were getting saved, being taught how to reach others, and then they would do the, repeat the process. The method was first used here, really, by Jesus, as he selects 12 men out of the thousands that he had followed him. And there were, there were many that followed him, right? We've seen the multitudes in multiple spots. But he personally chose out 12 to personally work with and train so that when he departed, these men would be equipped to take the gospel to the world through the same process. So let's look today at the start of the Lord's personal investment in these 12 men that would be replicated repeatedly throughout what we would call church history. First off, let's talk about the selection, the selection itself. Our passage opens up with Jesus going up onto a mountain, okay? And he's, 
originally going to go there alone. He's going to go there alone. You say, well, what's he going to do on that mountain? And he, as verse 13 says, and he goeth up into a mountain. And it goes on, it says, and calleth unto them whom he would. But there was, there's actually more detail to this that is not expounded in Mark's gospel, but we, we learn it as we cross-reference with Luke's. Luke 6, verse 12, tells us what he did. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. He went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Continued all night in prayer to God. In an all-night prayer meeting. Evidently, it, was, it must have been in regards to the big decisions that he was going to make the next day. The selection of the 12 men he had he'd have with him, that he would focus on. And even the Lord Jesus Christ here did not take this selection process lightly, even in this case giving up a night of sleep to commune with his father about this selection, about these twelve. I think it's worth noting here, we, what we see is a great example for us when it comes to making decisions in life, especially big decisions. We need the mind of God. And the only way we can get that is fervently asking him about it. We really need the mind of God, especially on big, life-altering decisions. You've got to be very, very mindful of what the Lord is telling you. Because the Bible promises us that God will guide our decision-making promises. Our, our processes, excuse me. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You need some guidance today. I need guidance every week. But let me tell you something. We need the heart and the mind of God on things. Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eye. We can't allow our emotional whims and personal preferences dominate our decision processes because that will never put us in a position to produce the fruit that God wants to bring through our lives. We need that. We need the mind of God. Big decisions, life-altering ones, must be given thorough time of prayer and consideration. And that's what we see with Jesus here. I mean, it's obvious. He went all night in this case. And we need, we need the mind of God as he will reveal his plans. He will work out obstacles. He will dismiss red flags. The worst thing we can ever do is charge forward on our own rationale because we do... Because we have to remember, we don't have the vantage point God does. We do not have the vantage point God does. And that's a sobering thing. Because everything can look really good for us, but God sees something differently. And Jesus, even Jesus here, <laughs> had to take this approach. Jeremiah 10.23 is a great verse. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in, in man that walketh to direct his steps. I believe Jesus here modeled that very well for us. Again, he was the son of God. He's perfect. He knew everything. <laughs> but yet he still took time to commune with the Father and find out, okay, Lord, <laughs> Father, what about these 12? Who are they? You know, you know God, is, is, is this right? I, I, we don't know what he all said, but we know that he spent time there. And afterwards, that's when he made his selection of these 12 now, after spending ample time with the Father, Jesus called the disciples up to the mountain where he was positioned. I don't know how that came about. I don't know if he yelled from on top of it. You know, come on up, guys. Maybe he saw them afar off and said, hey, come up here. But he had them come up. And it appears it was, it was more than just the twelve, actually. That it was just more than the twelve that, that were around. Verse 13 says, And he called unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. Luke 6, 13 tell us, tells us, And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Notice, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve. So there was more than just the twelve there. Was, who, we don't know how big of a crowd is. It, it was, but it was no doubt sizable to a certain extent. And one by one, he'd say, Peter, I want you to come here. James, John, would you come here, please? And Bartholomew, come here. Thaddeus, would you come here? And they came up to him. 
And he said, guys, I'm, on a, I'm calling you. I'm going to ordain you for a very special office. You're going to be apostles. Apostles. A very special, unique position that only you 12 are going to really possess. And of course, you see in verses 16 through 19, you see the 12 that are, are mentioned. Now, the word apostle means one sent forth or a messenger. These 12 held a special office that would lay the foundation of the New Testament church, Ephesians 2.20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The office ceased to exist after the passing of these men. We don't have apostles anymore. But they were personally selected by the Lord so that he could mentor them personally. Personally. Well, number two, we see what I call the scope. The scope. When Jesus selected these 12, he had some distinct goals, kind of a scope of, of what he was going to teach and what he was going to do within his mind. As they would, as mentioned, be the foundation for which the New Testament church would be laid upon. Verse 14, it says, And he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. I want to first focus first off on that first phrase in verse 14, or well, technically the second phrase, I guess, that they should be with him. They should be with him. Key thought, with him. See, these 12 were going to get an opportunity to shadow the Lord Jesus Christ as he ministered. They were going to be with him. I don't know if some of your people for the company, some of you work for, do you have people that shadow other people? They shadow, they come in, and, they, and uh, maybe you've been a customer, and you walk into a situation, and they'll say, well, so-and-so is shadowing me today or, or is following me around basically all day. I was at the Capitol here, I don't know when it was, sometime during the session, and, and I had a meeting with one uh, a, a, a rep or whatever, and, and they had a, there was a gal there, and, and, and the guy said, are you okay? She sits in here, she's, she's shadowing me today, and, and what, what she was doing, she was just kind of learning the ropes, as it were, up there at the Capitol. And maybe you've, you've been part of that, kind of a, uh, an opportunity for, them, for people to learn as they watch a person work. And that's, that's kind of what is going to happen here, as part of it at least. They'd watch Jesus, how he would handle situations that would crop up. I mean, they had, they had kind of what we would call front row seats to the action. They would listen to his words as he taught and what he said and, and, and what he didn't say even. I'm sure it caught his attention. They'd share in his triumphs. They would be there on those grand days. And they would be there when he shed tears. Like at the, at the tomb of Lazarus. They would uh, be with him wherever he went. The idea here is that more would be caught than even taught through what they witnessed. And sometimes that's the best way to learn, is just observing and replicating what's, what you've observed. And that's, that's what, they, what they're doing. And to have opportunity to, to learn and be involved and, and to have the master teacher be there right by the side and say, no, it'd be, you know, the good job here, maybe improve here, and, you know, how, how he would gently do that kind of stuff as a teacher and as a guide for these guys to become the people that he wanted them to become. Boy, what, what an opportunity <laughs> uh, to, be, to be selected here. I mean, it was quite, a, quite a, a, an honor, really. 
he would have times in which they would expound the scriptures, or he would expound the scriptures to them in personal study, where they could ask him questions, and he could respond, or they could talk about the events of the day, and he could bring back scriptural truths like, like he would do uh, periodically, as we see in the scriptures. They would learn how to pray together. They would, they would intercede. How would you love to have heard the prayers of Jesus Christ? I don't know about you, but I, I like to p- learn how to pray better. And you know what? To sit and listen to Jesus and his heart would have been really helpful. <laughs> and listen to that. You know, there was one time in Luke 11 where they said, Lord, teach us to pray, right? They would learn how to evangelize. They would learn how to reach out to people. They would learn how to trust God and find their needs met by the Lord, their spiritual needs, their emotional and their physical needs. They would learn all this by the time that they spent with Him. Discipleship, the best form of it, occurs when someone becomes willing to be open to sharing their Christian lives with another with the desire of encouraging and equipping that other person for the Lord. And that requires an investment of time, patience, and love. In so many ways, my wife and I were discipled by the same guy um, years ago when we got saved. We were part of a campus ministry. And the guy who, who, who ran that really did a good job discipling. I mean, he spent a lot of time with us. And... Uh, I think it's very similar for her and I. She came a few years after I did. But I remember where, where we were involved in Bible studies on Monday and Tuesday night and church on Wednesday night. And there was, I think, small groups at time on Thursday night. And, you know, we had church on Sunday. And, boy, we just had the opportunity to, to learn and to grow and, and things like that. We learned a lot in those early years. And it really helped us in our discipleship process. I can't say I've arrived yet, but I tell you something, I'm thankful that, I, that, that there were some things instilled in me early on in my Christian life that, I, I've never, that have never left me. I'm thankful that that individual taught me about the significance of reaching souls. I really am thankful for that. I'm really thankful uh, about, uh, about the, the issues on, on holiness and, and the issues of, of being faithful in God's house when the doors are open. I'm so thankful for that. I, I'm thankful for, uh, for other things as well, but it, we learn to minister and we learn to invest in those things. Why? Because somebody invested in us. Somebody invested their time, their treasure, and their talent within us. And it made, it made a difference in our lives. It really did. And there were many others... Uh, who had that same experience. The question for all of us is this. Is there somebody that God might want us to invest our lives into that we can take along the way and train? You know, I think discipleship really does begin in the home with our children. Those, they would be good candidates to start with. But what about somebody else even outside of our home? By the way, our children could learn a lot by bringing people in, trying to reach them with the gospel into our homes. That'd be a good idea. You know, we have lots of opportunity with international students. As an ex- that's one example of many. But you, you know, we can make those investments. I think God wants us to, in, in some capacity, to, to invest in reaching others. And when we reach others, to, to, to take them and, and encourage them and, and do what we can to teach them in, in, a, in a somewhat of an in, unfor, informal friendship-type environment. And that makes all the difference. You know, these guys were going to be able to get close enough to Jesus where they could talk about things openly. That's one thing about discipleship, too, that's really nice is that is that you, you can build a relationship with, with a person, especially somebody who's young in the Lord, that still has a lot of baggage, and they can have open conversations with you about some of the things that they're struggling with. Because I'll guarantee you that there, when you, first, you know, 
in my case, I got saved when I was 20. I still got baggage from back in those days. But you know something? It's nice to be able to talk about that, especially early on, because there's a lot of stuff you just don't understand and don't get. And, and to be able to talk to somebody about those things and be open and, and not be judged or, or whatever, or condemned for it, it's, that's really helpful because you know, it gives an opportunity, hey, look, I, I've got this problem. How do I deal with it? How do I solve it? And uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a nice thing to have. To come around and, and be like a mother hen around this individual. Not that you're sitting there, you know, uh, okay, sit down, we're going to, you know, whatever. But, but just to have that, that kind of uh, big brother or big sister in the Lord really does make a difference. And may I say this, if you're going to be a big brother and big sister, you better be consistent, too, with your Christian life. Don't say one thing and do another. Don't say you need to be in church and you're late and you're skipping, you're doing all that kind of stuff. Hey, let me tell you something. If we're going to teach others, we need to have a consistent life too. We're not going to be perfect. But we do need to have a consistency that we can look to and say, and they can say, hey, look, this is, <laughs> I, want to be, I want to be a, a good example, a good model for that, for that other person so that I can encourage them to be the person God wants them to be. See, the goal, Lord had a goal in, in the case for these guys to make them into preachers, that it should be with them and that he might send them forth to preach. In this case, they would have a designated office. But did you know that God wants all of his people to be preachers of the gospel? I'll explain what I mean. Romans 10, again, Romans chapter 10. I believe this is talking more than just the, the person who fills a pulpit. It says here, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom uh, they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring good, glad tidings of good things. Hey, look, I can't be in every location that you can be in. So you need more than just one preacher. <laughs> and guess what? You are a preacher as much as I can be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have a sermon all prepped. Like they say in Bible college, you have a sermon burning a hole in your pocket. You know, you don't need that. You just need to be able to explain some of the things I shared with to begin with. And God wants us to declare that. That's, that's what preaching is, just the declaration of a message. And our message is that God loves you. God wants you to, be, wants you to know him personally. God wants, your, wants to forgive you of all you've ever done. And God wants to bring you to heaven when you die. God wants a relationship with you. And this is how you get that. That's all. doesn't have to come down with fire and brimstone. But I tell you something, it can be effective coming from a heart that loves you, that loves people. Again, not everyone is going to fill a pulpit, but we all can be declares, declare, or declare the message of salvation with someone. Hence, God wants us each to preach in, in some capacity. The compassion and concern for souls, or, and have a compassion and concern for souls to reach out to them. These men, though, would get the opportunity themselves to be the messengers or the preachers of the Lord. But the Lord would not send them, just send them, but he'd also empower them. Verse 15, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. They gave them a, a unique empowering to get this done. Their witness would have strength because of God's power upon their lives as they went forth. Now, this period of time was before the Holy Spirit of God dwelt within people, okay? So this is a special unction. They even had some special powers we don't necessarily have right now of healing sicknesses. But there's a concept here, I think, worth considering. 
Again, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, those who are saved become indwelt by the Spirit of God. We, this is a basic doctrine we, we know. Preached here many times before. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. It's the Spirit that gives us power to be effective ministers of the gospel. It's the Holy Spirit that works through us to speak to an individual's heart that we're trying to reach out to. That's why somebody with the power of the Spirit of God upon them can have a broken testimony, uh, bumble through it. The, the, the words can be just like a toy falling down a set of stairs and still have an impact versus somebody who has no power but it gives the most eloquent speech you could ever hear. The Spirit of God is necessary to have for an effective witness. And you can sense it in, in some capacity. If you ever try to, try to keep yourself, you know, everything right between you and God, and seek to be filled, you, you can see it happen when you start talking and people start, you notice that they start getting under conviction. It's not the power of your words or mine. It's the Spirit of God hitting directly into their hearts. I'll never forget the first time I got under preaching and the Word of God was open and the guy got up and he spoke and, and I saw words in the scriptures that I, and, and I began to connect the dots a little bit for the first time that I was lost and it just convicted me. It wasn't the power of man's words, it was the power of the Spirit of God working through the Word of God to get my attention. And we need that. We need that if we're going to be effective. Jesus Christ gave them power because they, on their own, they couldn't handle anything. But with his power, all things were possible. It's the Spirit that gives us power to be effective ministers of the gospel. It's the Holy Spirit that speaks and convicts people of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. He's the one that works on the heart to bring people in line with God for salvation or for sanctification, whatever the need is. Our goal as saved people, as saved Christian people, is to allow God to have full control of our lives. Right? The Spirit of God to be filled with the Spirit, as Ephesians 5.18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit simply means our lives are under the control of the Spirit of God. That's all it means is that he controls us. We're filled up. <laughs> and he empowers. And he's got control. We allow him to dictate the decisions that we make and the responses we make. Every day, as God's people, we need to seek to be filled with the Spirit of God so that we may be the Christian people God has called us to be. That's called walking in the Spirit. We're familiar with that. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We need, to, we, we need to be seeking to walk in the Spirit, be in line with the Lord. Anything that's between us and God needs to be cleaned out, or else the Spirit is quenched, or He's grieved. And again, we have no power. And we, of course, with that, that God would use our witness to reach others. These guys were empowered or receive power over the enemy, and through the Spirit now, we have power over the enemy too, as long as we walk in the Spirit. These 12 men were going to have a much different life than I think they ever thought. As they stood on the seas, uh, many, many of them on the, on the shores of the Galilee, many of them having been fishermen and other things, thought this is what their life was all going to be. Boy, things were going to change in a way they never imagined. Because they received the opportunity of a lifetime to be personally invested in by God. Well, guess what? God wants to give that same thing to you and I as well. But he's looking for people who will invest in others themselves. He's looking for people who are willing to be taught by others so that he may make them into the people they want to be. You know, one thing, I, I think, I, I never would have imagined 
some of the things God has allowed me to do. My, I'm so thankful I got saved beyond uh, just what God has allowed me to be part of over the course of 23 years. I enjoy my Christian life fully. And I thank God that he saved me. And I thank God he put people in my life that invested in me. And I'm thankful he's put people in my life to encourage me along the way. May we all be like that for those that God wants to wants investments being made into. Because Jesus set the example with these men. He made a personal investment. Cost them time, cost them some trouble, cost them some, some things, but let me tell you something. When it was all said and done, we can look back now, and boy, it was a good investment. Because these 12 men turned the world upside down. Amen. They were the beginning of the greatest movement that has ever existed. May God help us to invest as he did. Let's stand to our